Hey, welcome to Sketchy EBM. I'm your host, Anthony Crocco, and today we're talking about clinical decision instruments. This is episode one of three, which we're going to title Derivation. There's a pretty good chance you've come across something called the clinical decision rule or clinical decision tool or clinical decision instrument. In emergency medicine, there's a bunch of these that come to mind. Things like the Ottawa ankle and foot rule, or the Ottawa knee rule, or the uh, Wells criteria. In pediatric eMERGE, we've got a whole bunch of different instruments to try and predict which kids with closed head injury need a CT scan. Although there are a number of different terms that we'll use to describe these, I prefer clinical decision instruments. It may be the inner amateur musician in me that prefers this term, but I actually don't like the word rule because it implies that we have to abide by it. And for every rule, there's an exception. So what's the point of having clinical decision instruments anyways? Well, I'd argue that there's actually a number of reasons why these things can be quite useful. First, it can save us time and money by minimizing the amount of unnecessary tests or investigations that we have to do for patients, and minimize the risk of adverse effects for patients from unnecessary tests or treatments. They can really help limit practice variation in a department. Clinical decision instruments most often help us with either diagnosis or prognosis. How we actually come up with clinical decision instruments is really important. This developmental process follows three different phases. The first study is always a derivation study. This should be followed by one or more validation studies. Finally, there should be an impact analysis done. In this episode, we're going to talk specifically about the derivation study. It's important to pay attention to the major limitation, and there's really just one, of the derivation study. A derivation study usually begins because somebody somewhere who's brilliant has a great idea. They see some need or some practice variation or unnecessary tests or treatments being done and try and think, well, maybe there's a way to circumvent that. Early on, the researcher should think to themselves, is a CDI actually possible? And sometimes it's not, either because of the type of illness that's being investigated or treated, the type of patient or the type of environment that's being worked in. Another important consideration early on is whether the clinical decision instrument is going to be simple or complex. Simple instruments are easy to remember and implement, but may not be as good as a complex instrument. However, a complex instrument may be too hard to remember and just not feasible to use. The next step in developing a clinical decision instrument is coming up with a long list of what we call candidate variables. These variables may be things on history that you ask, things that you examine on physical exam, or results of laboratory or investigations. It's important that candidate variables have very good inter-rater reliability, meaning that when you ask the question or do the physical exam, your finding is going to be similar to when I do it. The more candidate variables that you have, the larger the population you're going to have to examine to try and figure out which ones are actually important. The next step in a derivation study is to take these candidate variables and measure them in a population and follow that population through to see how those different candidate variables line up with whatever outcome you're looking for. There are a number of statistical methods that allow us then to pick out which variables seem to be most important. You can now use the data that you've garnered from your derivation study to construct a clinical decision instrument that best predicts whatever prognostic or diagnostic outcomes you're looking for. You may think to yourself, having just read a derivation study, that you know what? This clinical decision instrument is ready for prime time. Sadly, that's not the case. All clinical decision instruments require validation before implementation. And this is because some of the results from a derivation study may have happened by chance alone. And the only way to make sure that that's not the case is to do a validation study. More on that in episode two. I can give you a recent example where this was a real problem. A few years ago, a clinical decision instrument called the CATCH rule was developed. The purpose of the CATCH rule was to tell us which children with closed head injuries needed a CT scan. The derivation data looked great, as almost all derivation data does. People started using this rule clinically, and it even showed up on a national licensing exam. The validation studies that followed unfortunately did not show that the CATCH rule was that great, and it has since been abandoned. In the next episode of Sketchy EBM, we'll look at validation studies, why we do them, and what they tell us. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Sketchy EBM. Please do take the time to evaluate. And as always, remember to draw your own conclusions. 